Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start with our lecture on chapter 39, Fluid, Electrolytes, and Acid-Base Balance. You can find this in your book. Um, it starts on page 1461. So just a little bit of pathophysiology review. Okay, so when we're talking about acid-base balance and fluid electrolyte balance, we're talking about all of the fluid that is in the body and all of the solutes that are dissolved in that fluid. Okay, so what do we know about the fluid in the body? So water is the primary body fluid, okay? Um, water in the body varies depending on a lot of different factors. So the number of fat cells that a person has, a person's age or sex. So a lot of times women have more body fat, so they have less body fluid than men. Okay, you can see a little more information about this in your book on um, in table 39-1. Um, Water contains solutes, right? So body fluids in general contain gases, for example, CO2 and O2, and then it contains solutes, also known as just solid substances that are dissolved in the water, right? So there's two different kinds of solutes in our body's water, right? So one of those being electrolytes, okay? Um, these electrolytes develop an electrical charge when they're dissolved in water, okay? Examples of this would be sodium, potassium, that kind of thing, okay? Remember that electrolytes can carry either, either a positive or a negative charge, okay? Taking you back to anatomy and physiology or your advanced anatomy, you're talking about those cations and their anions, right? So they're, they're positive or they're negative charge. Um, so that's one of the types of solutes that's in body fluid. Um, the other kind is your non-electrolytes. So these are substances that don't conduct any electricity. For example, glucose. Okay, there's glucose dissolved in that, that body fluid, right? Um, so body fluids have a, a purpose, okay? So they maintain our blood volume, right? Um, they regulate our body temperature. They transport material to and from cells, and they serve as a medium for cellular metabolism and the excretion of waste, right? We know our kidneys is the main main filter of our bodies to get rid of that waste. Um, and that's got a lot to do with that cellular metabolism and that body fluid um, amount of how well the, the, the kidneys get that done, okay? That's why hydration is so, so important. So now digging a little deeper to your body fluid compartments. So you've got your intracellular fluid, your extracellular fluid, and then you've got third spacing, right? So um, let's go over these a little bit deeper. So intracellular fluid, this is your fluid that's contained inside the cells, okay? This is essential for cell function, for cell metabolism, and it accounts for approximately 40% of the body weight, okay? Um, in the intracellular fluid, um, the main cations that you're looking at is potassium and magnesium. Those are the main, the main electrolytes that you're going to find inside the intracellular fluid, okay, the fluid within the cell. Um, and then you've got your extracellular fluid. So extracellular fluid contains water, electrolytes, nutrients, and oxygen, okay, and, and it, it that I'm sorry, the extracellular fluid carries water, electrolytes, nutrient, and oxygen to the cells, and then it removes the waste, okay? The waste products being all of those products created by the cellular metabolism, right, that breakdown. Um, extracellular fluid accounts for about 20% of our body weight, and our common electrolytes for the extracellular fluid is going to be sodium for the most part, Okay? Um, so yeah, sodium for the most part on the extracellular fluid, right? Um, so moving on here. So when you're thinking about extracellular fluid, it exists in three main locations in the body. Okay. We've got our interstitial fluid, our intravascular fluid, and our transcellular fluid. So all of those three are all parts of the extracellular fluid, okay? Think of that extracellular fluid, that fluid outside the cell, that is your big umbrella, and then inside that umbrella, you've got your interstitial, intravascular, and transcellular fluid, okay? So your interstitial fluid, so this is the fluid that lies in the spaces in between the body cells, okay? Think of the interstitial as the in-between, right? So you've got your interstitial fluid. 
Um, what that is, if you've ever seen a patient that has edema, so that super, super swelling of typically the lower extremities, but you can see it anywhere. That excess fluid that that's in that interstitial space, that's what causes edema. So what you're seeing when you see edema is extra fluid in that interstitial space or the space in between the body cells, okay? Then you've got intravascular fluid. So this is the plasma within the blood. Main function is to transport blood cells, okay? Easy peasy. Transcellular fluid is going to include specialized fluids such as your cerebrospinal fluid or your pleural fluid, the fluid in your lungs or the peritoneal fluid or your synovial fluid and all of that. Your digestive juices even are in that, um, that category as well. And so again, when we're talking about third spacing, okay, so third spacing, certain conditions can cause fluid to move into an area that makes it physiologically unavailable. Okay, it's not available to be used by the body, such as into the peritoneal space. So in the abdomen, um, if you get fluid build up there into that abdomen and it's unavailable, we call that ascites. Okay, you see that a lot in liver dysfunction and also um, uh, like alcoholics, you see that a lot as well. Um, another space that you may find third spacing is the pericardial space. So that's like such as in pericardial effusion, which you'll learn about throughout the program. Um, or also third spacing can be into vesicles, otherwise known as blisters, right? During like a burn wound or something, okay? So the type, this type of fluid movement is known as third spacing because the fluid is literally trapped in a third compartment that is not within the inter interstitial area or the intravascular area, okay? It's caught in um, that third space, just locked into a compartment. So let's talk about the movement of fluid and electrolytes. Again, we're getting deep back into anatomy and physiology and just to doing a little review. And if you need a little bit more in-depth review, you can find this in your book. Okay, so let's refresh on passive transport. Okay, if you remember passive transport, this is transportation that requires absolutely no energy. Okay, it includes osmosis, which is the movement of water across the cell membrane from an area of less concentrated solution to more concentrated solution. Okay. Passive transport also includes diffusion. So this is the passive process where molecules or solutes move through a cell membrane from higher concentration to lower concentration, okay? Then there's filtration. So this is the movement of both water and smaller particles from an area of high pressure to low pressure, okay? So all of those can be passive transport transportation, okay? And then you have active transport. So if you remember what active transport is, this occurs when the molecules, like electrolytes, think electrolytes in this chapter. So active transport happens when these electrolytes move across the cell membrane from an area of low concentration to high concentration, okay? Active transport always requires energy expenditure for that movement to occur because it's going against a concentration gradient, okay? Um, ATP or the energy source is released from the cell to enable certain substances to acquire that energy that need, is needed to go through um, that cell membrane. Okay, so here on this slide you can see a compare and contrast between osmosis and diffusion to help you kind of wrap your head around that. So let's talk about fluid intake and output. I know we've talked about this a lot this semester and it will only get worse as you go through this program. Um, however, we're gonna go and like brush up on it a little bit. So what's the point? What's the point? So it, the point is to maintain homeostasis, okay? In order to do that, we need the intake and the output to be maintained equally, okay? Typically we know intake and output should equal each other, right? Your, your output should always be pretty much what your in, intake is. That doesn't always happen, right? So when we're talking about fluid intake. It's pre predominantly regulated by thirst, right? Predominantly regulated by how thirsty you are. So changes in plasma osmolality results in the hypothalamus telling the body to drink, okay? For example, if you have excess fluid loss or if you have a lot, if you're intaking a lot of sodium or salt, right? or if you have a decreased overall fluid consumption. So if those things happen, have you ever eaten something super, super, super salty and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so thirsty. Well, what's happening is that your body, your hypothalamus is telling your body to drink, okay? Because you've messed up the balance of the salt in your body, okay? That's how, that's, that's how that works, okay? So 
<clears throat> situations that may inhibit your thirst mechanism. Okay, so maybe these people are not going to have as great of um, an indicator of that thirst that's that's needed to balance those electrolyte levels is going to be if you're seeing p patients with fluid retention or if they have excessive hypotonic IV solutions, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, or if they have low sodium intake, or if they have an excessive consumption of oral fluids, things like that, okay? So we get our intake primarily through drinking fluids, okay? It's typically recommended that um, we intake 2,700 to 3,500 mils per day, okay? Um, typically... It looks like there's a typo on my slide here. In the red, it says generally at least 30 mils an hour. That's supposed to be under fluid output. So um, just pretend that that's moved right over here, and I will fix that after this PowerPoint is over. However, it doesn't belong over there. So um, we'll talk about that when I talk about output. But back to fluid intake. So we get about 20% of our fluid intake from food or the metabolism of food. And, our, and like we talked about, our fluid intake is regulated by thirst, okay? Now we're talking about fluid output. This gets important here. So fluid output, there's a variety of different kinds. So we've got our sensible fluid loss, okay? So this is easily measured fluid output. So urinary output. So again, pretend that that red mark, is the, that red text is over here on the fluid output side. So fluid output should be generally at least 30 mils per hour. If it, there's anything less than 30 mils per hour of output, it's a concern. It's low urine output and it's a concern about either kidney function or something is happening. Blood perfusion, you should be have a red flag if you're having less than 30 mils an hour. Um, so again, that's, your, that's a part of the sensible fluid loss is your urinary output. Okay, so also, so now we've got the sweat maybe. Sweat can be sensible or perceived fluid loss through the skin. Um, that occurs through perspiration. So the book is kind of confusing, but sweat is what they're really talking about here with that, okay? So perspiration varies based on temperature or skeletal muscle activity or metabolic activity, okay? Other outputs can be feces. So 100 to 200 mils per day of soft stools are going to contain more water than hard stools, so those would be counted as output as well if it's soft or liquid stools, okay? Um, as stool frequency increases, you're losing more water. So if a patient is having diarrhea, we should be thinking about the fluid loss that is accompanying that and the possible dehydration or electrolyte imbalance that may accompany that process, okay? So that's your, your uh, sensible fluid loss, okay? Um, when we're talking about insensible fluid loss, we're talking about fluid loss that um, is not easily measured. Okay, um, so from the lungs. So typically you have a, about a 300 mil per day out, insensible loss through the lungs as your water is exhaled in your breath. Okay, an increase in your respiratory rate increases the amount of fluid lost. Um, also skin or the integumentary system. Yep, it's very super confusing in your book. Um, however, it does have it in both categories. It has um, Get, uh, skin and perspiration insensible and insensible um, fluid loss. So, but think skin here in this insensible fluid loss. Think skin here instead of sweat. Okay. So when we're thinking about skin here, we're thinking about fever and some disease processes like metabolic activity and heat production. These things can lead to an increased fluid loss. Okay. Evaporation is also going to account for some insensible fluid loss through the skin. And then the skin, both sensible and insensible, is going to account for about 600 mils per day of um, fluid loss there. Okay, so throwing you a curveball question. So where would blood fit into this? Would it be sensible or insensible fluid loss? So blood is going to be sensible because you can measure the amount of blood that's lost. Okay, by the way, most patients can tolerate about a 500 mil amount of blood lost, okay? Um, so, okay, so now you're, let's let's do this question. So your patient has a trach and is on a vent. Is that gonna be sensible, sensible or insensible fluid loss with that? It's gonna be insensible, okay? Because you can't really track how much fluid they're losing from that trach, but we know that they are from the vapor and the aerosols, right? Um, can be up to 1.5 liters per day. And now what about this? Your patient has third spacing. So do we think that's sensible or insensible? 
that's going to be insensible as well because the amount's going to depend on how bad the third spacing is on that patient. Okay, so the important thing you need to know about this slide, or one of the most important things you need to think about is that generally your output is going to be at least 30 mils per hour. Okay, super important to know that number. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so another factor in regulating fluid volume is going to be hormonal regulation. Okay, so um, antidiuretic hormone or ADH. So pressure sensors in the vascular system, so think blood vessels, right? Um, they're going to stimulate or inhibit the release of ADH from that pituitary gland. Okay. Um, when you're thinking about that, we're thinking about ADH and how what it does. So it causes kidneys to retain fluid. Okay, when ADH is stimulated to be released, it's going to cause the kidneys to retain fluid. If fluid volume within the vascular system is low, then fluid pressures within, within that system are going to decrease and then more ADH is going to be released. If fluid volume or pressure increases, then less ADH is going to be released and the kidneys are going to eliminate more fluid from the body. Okay, ADH is also produced in response to a rise in serum osmolality, fever, pain, stress, and then some opioid use as well. Okay, and then another factor, so we've got our renin-angiotensin syndrome system. So when extracellular or intravascular fluid volume is decreased, so from blood loss, let's say, right? General receptors in those glomeruli um, are going to respond to that decreased perfusion to the kidney. So the kidney is getting less blood, right, because we're losing blood somehow. We're hemorrhaging. We're, we're, we're having blood loss, massive blood loss. Our kidneys are getting less blood. So now our kidneys are going to release renin, okay? Renin is an enzyme responsible for the chain of reactions that converts, ren converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, Okay, angiotensin 2 acts on the nephrons to retain sodium and water and directs it to the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. The, all of these things together are going to increase that fluid volume. So this is a protective measure. Okay, if you remember that aldosterone is going to stimulate those distal tubules of the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and, and get rid of potassium. Again, um, causing that increase in fluid um, volume. Um, we're fat, intravascular volume. That's what I was trying to go with that. Okay. Um, and then thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is going to affect fluid volume by influencing cardiac output. An increase in thyroid hormone um, causes an increase in cardiac output, therefore increasing glomerular filtration. So glomerular, always think kidney, right? So it's going to increase that glomerular filtration rate and subsequently the urine output is going to increase. Okay, another protective measure, right? A decrease in thyroid um, hormone is going to have the opposite effect. And then brain neuritic factor. Um, this is something you guys can read about in your book. You don't really need to know a ton about this, but um, this is something, this can actually be a lab value that we look at very closely um, to monitor um, the level of um, congestive heart failure and, and, and things like that. So um, that's something that you can look at in your book, but it's a little bit complicated for where we're at right now. So what are your major electrolytes in your body? Who are your major players in the game? Okay, so um, sodium. We know what sodium is. So sodium, you need to know that the um, shorthand for sodium is Na+. Plus, okay, so sodium. This is your major cation in the extracellular fluid. Okay, its primary function is to regulate fluid volume, and it is the primary regulator of fluid volume. Sodium is the primary regulator of fluid volume, okay? It's um, when sodium is reabsorbed in the kidney, water and potassium follow, okay? With that, it maintains extracellular fluid volume, okay? According to the Dietary Guidelines of Americans, um, adults should limit their sodium intake to 2,300 milligrams per day. Um, for patients who have certain medical conditions or for African Americans or older adults or a person with um, chronic disease, they should limit their sodium to 1,500 milligrams per day. Okay, so that's sodium. Okay, sodium, primary regulator of fluid volume. Then we've got potassium. So we abbreviate that K+. 
K plus means potassium, right? So this is the major cation in the intracellular fluid. Okay, only 2% of the body potassium is found in the fluid, in the extracellular fluid. Okay, it's mainly in the intracellular fluid. So potassium is a key electrolyte in cellular metabolism. Okay, according to dietary guidelines, we should have at least 4,700 milligrams per day of um, potassium. However, most American women ages 31 to 50 consume less than half of that recommended amount. Okay. Um, potassium is a lot responsible for muscle contraction and cardiac conduction. So when you're thinking of an, an imbalance in potassium, rather low or high, you should always be considering um, the effect that that could have on the heart because it can mess up those electrical impulses of the heart and turn into a big, big problem. Um, take a look in your book on table 39-3 um, for those major electrolytes, their function, how they are, are regulated, and what foods they're found in. You're going to need to know that table pretty well for your exam. Um, other electrolytes, so calcium, <coughs> abbreviated CA++. So <coughs> calcium is responsible for bone health and neuromuscular and cardiac function, okay? It's also an essential factor in blood clotting. About 99% of body calcium is located in the bones and teeth, and the remaining 1% circulates in the blood and affects system functions, okay? As serum levels of calcium drop, calcium leaches from the bones and into the blood to compensate. So if dietary intake of calcium is not sufficient to replace it, bone loss is going to occur. Prolonged deficiencies of calcium is going to lead to osteoporosis or that weakness or softening of the bones. Um, magnesium, Mg++. So magnesium is a mineral that is um, used in more than 300 biochemical reactions in the body. Okay, like calcium, only about 1% of magnesium is found in the blood. The remaining 99% is divided between the intracellular fluid and the bone. Okay, some malabsorption disorders may cause magnesium depletion. Um, you also may see low magnesium in alcoholics. Alcoholism leads to low levels of that as well. Um, and then chloride. So chloride is the most abundant anion um, in the extracellular fluid. So it is usually bound with other ions, especially sodium or potassium. Um, and a healthy adult between the ages of 19 and 50 should con consume 2.3-ish grams of chloride each day um, to replace losses and keep stable blood, blood levels. And you abbreviate that CL negative, okay? Um, and then we have phosph phosphate or phosphorus, same thing. So PO4 negative, right? So most phosphorus found in the body is combined with oxygen forming phosphate, okay? Um, mostly bound with calcium in the teeth and the bones as calcium phosphate. So depending on its binding factors, the, the name changes a little bit, okay? So phosphate is the most abundant intracellular anion, and phosphate and calcium exist in an inverse relationship, okay? So when phosphate's high, calcium's going to be low. When calcium's high, phosphate's going to be low. That's an inverse relationship. When one goes up, the other's going to go down. They're opposite. Um, and then bicarbonate or HCO3 negative. So bicarbonate is present in both the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid, okay? The kidneys regulate extracellular bicarbonate to maintain an acid-base balance. When serum levels of bicarbonate rise, the kidneys excrete excess bicarb, okay? If serum levels of bicarbonate are low, the kidneys conserve bicarbonate. Okay, so it's all that trying to balance, okay? So this is a really, really important slide that you need to pay attention to for your exam. You will absolutely be tested on the levels of these particular um, lab values. You need to know them. You need to know these normal ranges. You need to know what's too low, what's too high, and what's normal for all of these. These are all important lab values for you to know, and you, they will be on your exam. Okay, 
So let's talk about a CBC. So here to the left of the screen, you can see a CBC or complete blood count. So when we're talking about a complete blood count. This is a lab test that is ordered under that name, a complete blood count or a CBC. And it contains more tests than just these that I've listed, but I've listed the ones that are important for you to know so that you can know when something is abnormal when they just speak it to you. Yes, the lab where you work is going to have normal ranges written out. And no, you don't necessarily need to have every lab value memorized to be a good nurse, um, but there are important ones that you do need to know, um, and I've listed those here, okay? So hemoglobin. So remember that hemoglobin measures the protein molecule in the red blood cells that carry oxygen from the lungs to the body tissues. Okay, so this is gonna be a big indicator in oxygenation status. Or if, if hemoglobin's too low, you've got anemia or blood loss. Something is happening with that and that should be your red flag, right? So normal hemoglobin levels is between 12 and 18, okay? You'll probably notice in your book or in other sources that they have different values listed for men and women. However, these values on this slide, I've combined them to um, eliminate confusion for you with your exam. So if you memorize the levels in the, this slide, this is gonna be best for your exam, okay? Um, and then hematocrit. So hematocrit is gonna measure the proportion of red blood cells in your blood. So again, this is gonna help you identify oxygenation or anemia. So it's always measured in a percent. So it's just saying what percent of the red blood cells are in your blood, okay? How many, what percent of this blood sample are red blood cells? So normal is gonna be from 37 to 52%. That's a normal hematocrit level. White blood cells. So white blood cells is gonna measure white blood cells in your blood sample. It's gonna indicate an infection. If it's high, we're thinking infection. This is a problem. This patient has an infection. Um, if it's below 5,000, we're thinking this patient is immunosuppressed. So their immune system is not working, so why? And then we would think about other things that could cause that, such as um, leukemia or um, things like HIV or something like that. So white blood cells, normal is going to be 5,000 to 10,000 mm3, okay? And then platelets, those are important. So this is going to measure the amount of platelets in the blood, okay? So this is indicating um, a clotting status, right? So it can identify clotting or bleeding disorders. So normal is from 150,000 to 400,000 mm3. So if you're having less than 150,000 platelets, you're probably at risk for increased bleeding, if you have more than 400,000 platelets in your sample, then you are at a, a risk for increased clotting, okay? And neither one are good. And then you've got your CMP or your BMP. You may hear it called either one of these names. So basically, they're the same exact thing. One is a complete metabolic panel. The other one's called a basal metabolic, metabolic panel. Same test. And again, there's more to be tested in these lab tests than what I've listed, but I've, I've picked out the important things I feel. So um, your sodium count. So we talked about sodium already. Your normal level is going to be 135 to 145. Okay. Milla equivalents per deciliter is what the, that stands for. MEQs slash GL. Milla equivalents per deciliter. Okay. That's how, that's how a lot or most of these um, electrolytes are going to be measured. So your sodium, 135 to 145. Potassium, normal is going to be 3.5 to 5. Calcium, normal is 8.5 to 10.5. Magnesium, normal 1.6 to 2.6. Chloride, 97 to 107. And blood urea nitrogen, okay, or BUN, or your BUN, right, your BUN. So with this lab, BUN and then the one below it, creatinine, those are the two main indicators for kidney function, okay? When somebody is, when we're concerned about someone's kidney function, we're drawing a BUN and a creatinine, okay? So those are just going to tell you what's happening with their kidney function. So remember, our kidneys are our main filter, right? So BUN normal value is going to be 10 to 31, and your creatinine normal value is going to be 0 0.5 to 1.2, Okay, those are important to know as well. And then lastly, but certainly not least, is glucose. So 75 to 110 is what your book uses as normal.
okay? All of these lab values will fluctuate depending on where you work. Um, however, for your exam, this is what you should be using. Also make sure to review the table 39-5 um, on page 1470 for ad additional information on causes, signs and symptoms, and treatment of different electrolyte imbalances because you need to know these for your exam. So here's a crash course on glucose, okay? When we're talking about, we're not gonna get into diabetes mellitus in this course or anything crazy. However, um, you do need to know the basics of hyper and hypoglycemia and how sugar um, can really be detrimental to the body in large amounts, okay? So glucose is the main source of energy for your body, okay? It is the main source of energy for your brain and your brain power, and the body will not survive very long without glucose, okay? So after digestion of food, glucose is going to enter the bloodstream, hence a blood glucose level, okay? And that, that CMP that we just talked about on the previous slide, normal being 75 to 110, we're talking about this, food has been digested, glucose enters the bloodstream, we draw that, that's what we get, right? So blood glucose level, that's what happens. So in order for this energy or this glucose to be used, it has to get out of that bloodstream and into the cell. The cell has to be able to use it, but it can't use it while it's just in the bloodstream. It needs to get into the cell, okay? The increased level of glucose in the bloodstream triggers the release of insulin from the pancreas, okay? Glucose cannot enter the cell without insulin. Think of insulin as the key to unlock the cell so that the glucose can leave the bloodstream and enter the cell, okay? That's how that works. In diabetes mellitus types one and two, they're characterized by insulin deficiency, which they means they don't have enough, they have absolutely none, as in type one diabetics have absolutely no insulin that they make on their own. And, and type 2 has insulin resistance, which means their insulin doesn't work as well, so to speak. Um, and this often causes too much glucose to remain in the bloodstream without a way for it to get into the cell, okay? And that's where problems happen. That's where you get your hyperglycemia, right? Your hyper is high, okay? So let's talk about that. So hyperglycemia, this is glucose levels above 110. Signs and symptoms you're looking for, increased thirst, okay? In the same way we talked about when we eat too much salt, we get super thirsty because of all that sodium that's now floating around our bloodstream. Same thing with the sugar, okay? If, our, if we get hyperglycemic where we have too high a sugar level in our bloodstream, it's going to trigger that thirst mechanism in our body. So the big signs of, of hyperglycemia, increased thirst, frequent urination because they're drinking so much, now they're peeing a lot, right? <coughs> And also, to add to that, the body is trying to get rid of that excess sugar because it's not good for us in that bloodstream. So the body is trying to filter it out with the kidneys. So you're peeing a lot, right? You have dry mouth. You might have blurred vision because that high sugar hides behind your retina in your eyes, okay? You also may have weakness because you don't have any energy because that sugar can't make it into the cells to give you energy. And you may have a headache, Okay, because your brain needs sugar to work, right? So hyperglycemia. Typically, you'll notice the, the cardinal signs they're going to tell you for hyperglycemia or diabetes, your cardinal symptoms are polydipsia, which means drinking a lot, polyuria, which means you are peeing a lot, and polyphagia, which means you are eating a lot. And the reason you continue to be super hungry with hyperglycemia is because your body is telling you you're hungry because you don't have enough energy in your cell because all that sugar is hanging out in the bloodstream instead of getting into the cell. So that's hyperglycemia. On the contrast, hypoglycemia is low blood sugar, glucose levels below 70. So signs and symptoms of this are going to be sleepiness, confusion, sweating, pale colored skin or pallor, irritability, and hunger again, okay? You'll die from either one of these, okay, if, uh, if left untreated. They're both very dangerous. So blood sugar mnemonic, way to remember, hot and dry, sugar's high, cold and clammy, needs some candy, okay? That'll kind of tell you about hot and dry, hot, super hot flushed skin, dry mouth, super thirsty, sugar's high. 
cold, sweaty, clammy, need some candy. Sugar's low, right? All right, now we're going to get a little bit into acid-base balance. I don't want you to dig too much into this in your book because it gets really complicated and you're not going to be tested on it a ton. Actually, probably not at all in this class, but it it you will get it in this program, but it's a little bit too advanced for us right now. So I'm just going to give you a little crash course. You do need to know the basics. So acid-base balance. So acids and bases are part of a normal metabolic process within the body. Okay, so when we're talking about an acid, an acid is a compound in the body that contains hydrogen ions. Okay, um, those hydrogen ions and acids can be released. Okay, so they're considered donors because they can donate a hydrogen icon, ion to somebody, something, whatever, in the body that needs it. Um, a base, okay, think of a base as an alkaline. So the opposite of an acid, right? Acid, alkaline, acidic, alkaline. Okay, so bases are alkaline. So this is a compound that can accept a hydrogen ion in a solution. So bases are considered a cation acceptor. So we've got the acid, which is the donor, and the base that is the acceptor, okay? And then we're talking about pH. So this is the amount of acid or base that's present in a solution, okay? pH is measured on a scale of 1 to 14. A pH of 7 is neutral. Anything less than 7 is acidic. Anything greater than 7 is a base. So that's the normal scale. Our bloodstream must be kept at a very delicate range between 7.35 and 7.45. Okay? Anything less than that is too acidic. Anything more than that is too basic. Okay? That's when we start getting into problems is when we get less or more than that. <coughs> So acid-base regulation. So with that, there's a buffer system, okay? Buffer systems prevent wide swings in body or bloodstream pH, okay? A buffer system consists of a weak acid and a weak base. And buffer molecules keep strong acids or strong bases from altering the pH either way by either they absorb or release free hydrogen ions, okay? That's the point of the buffer system, okay? Um, there are multiple ways for this buffer system to work. So there's respiratory mechanisms that can help buffer that. So the lungs, they're the second line of defense to restore a normal pH level, okay? They control the body's um, carbonic acid supply from carbon dioxide retention or removal, right? So when the serum pH is too acidic, so the pH number is low, right? Because it's close to an acid going lower, right? The number's low, less than 7.35. The lungs are going to remove that carbon dioxide through rapid deep breathing. This is going to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide available to make that carbonic acid. If the serum pH is too alkaline or the pH is high, right? Closer to 14 on that scale. The lungs try to conserve carbon dioxide through shallow respirations, okay? This system works with the carbonic acid and the sodium bicarbonate buffer system to maintain that perfect acid-base balance, okay? So that's how the respiratory buffer system works. Um, the renal mechanisms for a buffer system are also at play. So the renal system is the last line of defense, okay? This is going to regulate the, the um, concentration of the bicarbonate. So the kidneys can neutralize more acid or base than either the respiratory system or the chemical buffers, okay? So if serum pH is too acidic, the kidneys can serve additional bicarbonate, which is your base, okay, to neutralize the acid, right? If the serum pH is too alkaline or basic, the kidneys excrete additional bicarb to lower the amount of that base and therefore decrease the pH, Okay, that's as deep as I'm getting into it with you. Okay, it doesn't need to be all crazy. I want you to review this acidosis versus alkalosis. Okay, because when you're talking about acidosis, you get into different um, conditions where your bloodstream gets either too acidic or too basic. And when that happens, you, um, when that happens, lots of, terrible things happen to your body. And that's really all there is to that. Okay. So acidosis means your, your bloodstream, your blood is too acidic. Okay. So this chart is going to tell you kind of what happens. Your pH drops, um, 
hyperventilation happens, then your body conserves HCO3 and then excretes that hydrogen ion. Whereas if your body's too alkaline or too basic for some reason, you're going to get hypoventilation to compensate for that. So I don't want you to um, get too crazy into this um, crazy process, okay? I want you to just review this slide and try to make it make sense in your head. And then that's about all I need you to do with that. This is also a nice picture as well here. So acid-base balance. So we can see that this guy over here, um, this takes you all through the buffer system, right? So this guy up here, he's got a lots and lots of hydrogen ions up here. So he took too many hydrogen to make more acid. The body works with a very narrow range. So small pH changes alter that biological process. Okay, and then you've got this person over here. So most diseases can cause an imbalance. An imbalance can cause more problems than the disease itself. Okay, and then you've got your first line of defense here. I am first to respond to keep the pH balanced to neutralize the pH. So that's your hydrogen. Then you've got your buffer here. If Buffy can't handle it, then I step in to control it. So that's your respiratory system. And then you've got your renal system. I'm slow but dependable. Right, he can neutralize it, but he's the very last to, to go to the, to the party, okay? Again, not a big part of your exam, just you need to be introduced to it in this class, okay? So here is where things start to get super important. We do, again, as we talked about, we do need to know the electrolyte levels, what they do, signs and symptoms, things like that. You do need to know that stuff for your exam. You'll need to know about this as well, your fluid, your fluid imbalances. So we're talking about fluid imbalances. So these involve either a deficit or an excess, or there's a pro there's some kind of problem with the distribution of fluid in the compartments when we're talking about fluid involve, um, imbalances, okay? So fluid volume deficit. This is also known as hypovolemia, okay? When you think about volemia, I want you to think about blood. So hypo, low, vol, volume, and emia is always meaning blood, so low blood volume. If you break that, that word down, that's what it means, okay? So we're thinking about that. Um, this occurs when there's a proportional um, loss of fluid and electrolytes from the extracellular fluid, okay? So loss of blood volume um, in, in some route, so dehydration or um, excessive vomiting, um, excessive diarrhea, um, blood loss from traumatic injury or a, or a birth or something. Some reason, right? So when we're thinking about um, signs and symptoms of fluid volume deficit, okay, we're what are we going to see? What's our patient going to show us? So first of all, thirst is one of the very first signs, okay, because they don't have enough volume in their body, so they're going to be very thirsty, right? They're going to have dry skin. They're going to have dry mucous membranes, Okay, I have that dry, furry tongue because they're dehydrated. They're going to have non-elastic skin turgors. They're going to have tenting, right, because they're dehydrated. Um, they're going to have decreased urine output because their kidneys are not getting perfused like they should because they don't have volume in their blood, right? And then their blood pressure is going to go down, so they're going to experience hypotension. And because they're losing volume, they've lost their blood pressure, the heart is going to jump in and try to increase the blood volume so they're going to get tachycardia, right? They're going to have a high heart rate to try to help increase that stroke volume, right? Then they're also going to have a rise in temperature, okay? So remember that that vasoconstriction, so your vessels are going to get smaller in order to help keep that blood pressure normal, okay? It's going to try. It's going to help to circulate and perfuse the vital organs. So... Um, you just want to make sure that you... Um, watch out for these kind of things. And then weight loss, um, if it's sudden, like if it's a sudden 5% loss in body weight, that's considered clinically significant. Um, when you get up to 15% of body weight, then that gets to be um, a real problem, okay? Can, can even be fatal if the cause is from fluid volume, okay? Um, a patient who has a fluid volume deficit usually has an elevated blood urea nitrogen or BUN and creatinine, okay, because there's less water and, and, and it's not perfusing the kidneys as well, right? So that's fluid volume deficit, okay? Now we're talking about fluid volume excess. So these people have too much fluid volume, 
okay? Hypervolemia, so too much blood, too much fluid in their body, okay? So this involves excessive retention of sodium and water in the extracellular fluid, okay? Fluid volume excess can result from a variety of things, excessive salt intake, diseases affecting the kidney or liver function, or a poor pumping action of the heart, um, all of these things, cardiac function, poor cardiac function, um, symptoms that you're looking for when you're talking about excess fluid volume. So um, blood pressure is going to go up, right? Because they have additional fluid in there to cause the pressure. Okay, so they're overhydrated. So elevated blood pressure, you're going to see. You're going to see a bounding pulse because they've got lots of fluid volume in there, right? Um, you're going to see respirations that are increased and shallow, um, you may see that neck veins are going to be distended, like jugular vein distension, along with um, edema. There may be lots of edema, as you can see in this picture. You can see those fingerprints on this lady's foot that are just stuck there because she's got so much fluid in that, that those spaces. Um, their skin may be pale and cool. Their urine output's going to be a lot right? Because they're very overhydrated. They're going to be peeing a lot and it's going to be very diluted, right? So what's going to happen to their specific gravity, right? Very diluted pee. Um, the patient's going to rapidly gain weight, okay? And then if they have severe fluid overload, they're going to develop those moist crackles in the lungs, right? Those wet, that wet sound. And they're going to get that shortness of breath. And they may even get ascites, which is that edema in that peritoneal cavity, okay? So let's test your knowledge. So on assessment of a patient with acute renal failure, the nurse finds the following, distended neck veins, cool and pale skin, and crackles in the lungs. The nurse should suspect the patient is experiencing what? The correct answer is hypervolemia, okay? That was an easy one. That was right after we got done talking about it. That's not fair. Okay, so when we're talking about electrolyte imbalances, you do need to know these, okay? You need to know the signs and symptoms of these. Okay, so you can refer to the table on um, page 1471 to 1472, table 39-5, okay? So you've got your sodium. We know sodium is one of our electrolytes. So when we have not enough sodium, it's called hyponatremia. When we have too much sodium, it's called hypernatremia, okay? So with hyponatremia, so low sodium level in the blood, this is going to be caused by, um, can be caused by diuretics those medications that we give patients to pee, right? And they pee out all their sodium. Um, GI fluid loss, so excessive vomiting or excessive diarrhea, right? Can also be caused by adrenal insufficiency, excessive um, intake of certain kind of IV fluids, things like that. Hypernatremia, what's gonna cause high blood sodium? So excessive sodium intake, if we eat too much sodium. Um, water deprivation, because if we don't have enough fluid in our body, we're going to have too much sodium dissolved in not enough fluid, okay? I always like to explain electrolyte um, concentration in the blood as making Kool-Aid. So if you consider you get a big pitcher out to make your Kool-Aid and you put just a little, you know, maybe one cup of water in this big pitcher, just one cup of water and six capfuls of Kool-Aid, it's going to taste super, super, super bitter because there's so much solutes in there or the Kool-Aid powder, right? Solutes. Think of solutes as your electrolytes. There's so many of them and not enough water, right? But if you add water and you don't add an any more solutes, then you've balanced out. Okay, and that, that happens here with electrolyte and fluid balance. So you need to consider that. So again, um, more causes of hypernatremia. So water deprivation, as we talked about. Um, and then increased water loss through profuse sweating or a heat stroke or um, something like that. Okay, so causes of, so when we talk about potassium, right, we're talking about low potassium hypokalemia, high potassium hyperkalemia. Okay. Hypokalemia is going to be caused by diuretics again. Um, GI fluid loss through nausea, vomiting, gastric suction, diarrhea. Um, other causes can be anorexia or bulimia as well. 
And then hyperkalemia, different causes can be renal failure or other types of diuretics that are potassium sparing. Um, patients who may have a high potassium intake, that can cause hyperkalemia. Okay, um, things like that. Then when we talk about calcium, we've got hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia. Okay, so hypocalcemia, this can be caused by hypoparathyroidism, can be caused by malabsorption or pancreatitis, um, even a vitamin D deficiency um, with this. So patients who have hypocalcemia, they're going to present with complaints of muscle spasms or tetany. Okay, um, so as a nurse, we can check for um, a positive Trousseau's sign and or a positive Shovstek sign. Okay, so I will show you on the next slide what those are and how to perform those. But that has to do with hypocalcemia. Okay, then we've got hypercalcemia. So this can be caused by hyperparathyroidism, malignant bone disease, prolonged immobilization, right? Things like that. <clears throat> then we talk about magnesium. So we've got hypomagnesemia and hypermagnesemia. So with hypomagnesemia, this is the one that you see a lot with chronic alcoholism. So low magnesium with chronic alcoholism, right? Um, a, a lot of times they'll present with disorientation and tachycardia when you see alcoholics with this problem. Can also be caused by diabetic ketoacidosis or prolonged gastric suction as well. And then hypermagnesemia. So this is caused by typically renal failure or adrenal insufficiency. And then lastly, we've got phosphorus. So hypophosphatemia, this is caused by, um, can be from diabetic ketoacidosis as well or respiratory acidosis. And then your hyperphosphatemia, this can be caused by renal failure, hyperthyroidism, chemotherapy, um, things like that. So talking back to um, hypocalcemia, so Trousseau sign. So this is the introduction of a carpopedal spasm by inflammation, sorry, <laughs> inflation of a smig, smig man manometer <laughs> above SBP for three minutes, okay? So you put on a blood pressure cuff to your patient, you inflate it above their systolic blood pressure and you leave it inflated for three minutes, okay? Um, the response is going to be a carpopedal spasm. And what happens is adduction of the thumb, flexion of the metacarpopharyngeal joints, and then extension of those interpharyngeal joints and flexion of the wrist, as in this picture. And that can be that sign of hypocalcemia. Um, another way to check is for shove sex sign. So this is contraction of the ipsilateral facial muscle that is elicited by tapping the facial nerve just anterior to the ear. Twitching of the lip um, or spasm of all the facial muscle, muscles is a positive shove sex sign. Okay. So acidosis and alkalosis. Okay. So this is all we're going to do with this. I'm going to tell you that to be acidotic, your serum pH has to be less than 7.35. Okay. Typically a cause of this retention of CO2, a metabolic cause of this, loss of bicarbonate, okay? To be alkalotic, your serum pH is gonna be above 7.5, so you're blowing off too much CO2, okay? You're, you're getting rid of your acid out of your body, so now your acid is too, or your, your bloodstream is too basic or too alkaline. Or there's an increase in the bicarbonate, okay? That's really the gist of it. This is talking about interpreting um, arterial blood gases. So it's taught in your medical surgical nursing courses. So skip over this part in your book where it talks about interpreting ABGs um, and don't, don't deal with that. So what you need to understand at this point is the mechanisms that are involved in acid-base balance. That if there is, if your bloodstream is too acidic or too alkaline, that there are respiratory mechanisms and there are renal mechanisms and there are buffer systems that all regulate the acid-base balance. That's what you need to know, okay? You need to know that the lungs control the carbonic acid supply by regulating CO2, which is an acid, right? And if you have retention of CO2 in your body, that you're going to have a decreased pH or an acidic level, okay? 
Kidneys are going to regulate plasma bicarb and reabsorb that other bicarb. Therefore, it's going to regulate the acid-base balance, okay? Buffer systems, you just need to know, prevent wide swings in the pH by absorbing and releasing free hydrogen ions. And that's all we're going to talk about that. So moving into the nursing process. So when we're talking about patients with electrolyte or fluid imbalances or even acid-base balances as well, we're going to do our head-to-toe physical assessment. Okay, we're going to get a focused nursing history. We're going to ask questions about primary medical history, current health concerns, food and fluid intake, food elimination, what meds are you taking? Okay, then we're going to do a focused nursing assessment. We're going to take our physical assessment finds, findings correlated with their nursing history and their lab data. Okay, we're going to get labs if we need to. We know that a CBC and a CMP can show fluid changes, right? Um, we're going to look at their electrolyte levels their BUN and creatinine ratio to see if they are having kidney failure or kidney problems, right? We're going to do all of these things. We're going to count their intake and output as well, at least 30 mils an hour of output, right? Um, when we're talking about nursing diagnoses, these are appropriate nursing diagnoses for patients with fluid imbalances or electrolyte imbalances. These have all been approved. Nursing intervention, so what are we going to do about it? So we're going to do dietary teaching to our patient, okay? We're going to promote to promote fluid and electrolyte balance. They need to, we need to teach our patients that they need to limit their sodium intake and increase their dietary potassium and calcium, okay? Most people consume more sodium than they should and not enough potassium and calcium. So I want to teach them to eat foods that are rich in potassium and calcium every day um, and have them read food labels, right? <coughs> we also want to educate our patient on um, electrolyte supplements. So maybe encourage clients to take potassium supplements with juice to mask the taste if they don't like them, if they're ordered by their physician. Um, teach them to take their supplements as prescribed, okay? They need to be viewed as a part of their treatment plan, those substances, okay? Um, we need to educate them on parenteral fluids, right? So IV fluids. Um, we need to make sure that whatever fluid we're giving is the appropriate fluid to give for the correct imbalance, right? Um, we also need to uh, monitor oral or tube feedings as well if they are getting that. Um, and then we'll talk about fluid classifications on the next slide here. As you see, um, IV fluids can be isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic. And we'll talk about that here in the next picture. So IV fluids are classified by how they compare to the osmolality of the blood. Okay, so there's three classifications. So there's an isotonic solution. So this is where the fluid is going to remain in the intravascular compartment. Okay, this is great for patients who have hypotension or hypovolemia, an isotonic solution. So patients at risk for fluid volume excess must be closely monitored when they receive isotonic fluids because they may easily develop fluid overload, okay? Patients at risk for fluid volume excess must be closely monitored when they receive isotonic fluids, right? Because if you can see on this picture, isotonic, they have equal solutes. Okay, the, the blood and this solution have equal solutes, equal water, no net, no net movement, okay? And the, the cell remains normal. So after the fluid goes into the cell, the cell remains normal looking because it's isotonic, it's equal, okay? Example of this would be normal saline, 0 0.9 normal saline or lactated ringers solution. Then there's a hypotonic solution. So this is going to pull water, body water, out of the intravascular compartment because its osmolality is less than that of the serum, okay, in a hypotonic solution. So therefore, when it's infused, they pull body water from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial fluid compartment, okay? It's used to correct cellular dehydration. So the cell was maybe uh, shriveled a little bit, and now we're wanting to pull fluid into that cell to rehydrate it. Okay, an example of this is when you have a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis, maybe, 
and all that glucose is pulling the water out of the cell, which makes the cell all shriveled up and dehydrated. So we would give a hypotonic solution to get the fluid back into the cells. Okay, if you see it on this picture, it's the last column. So um, the, the um, concentration is the higher solute is inside, the higher water is outside, so the water moves into the cell, and the cell swells up. It gets bigger, right, because it was dehydrated, and it's getting bigger because that's what we're trying to do. We're never going to give hypotonic solutions to patients at risk for increased cranial pressure because it can worsen edema, as we can see that, okay? Examples of this is D5W or half normal saline, 0.45 normal saline, okay? And then lastly, there's hypertonic solutions. So this is going to pull body water into the intravascular compartment because the osmolality is higher than that of the serum. Okay, so you can see that in the first column, higher solute outside, higher water inside. Water is going to move out and the cell is going to shrink, right? Hypertonic fluids can help stabilize blood pressure, increase urine output, and reduce edema, right? Because it's pulling water out of the cell and into the vascular compartment where it can then go perfuse the kidneys, right? So that's why it's going to help with urinary output and increasing blood pressure. Hope that makes sense, right? So um, examples of this is going to be like D5 half normal saline or D5 LR. Those both do, do that kind of thing, okay? So here's just a way to remember isotonics solutions stay where I put it, right? Stay where I put it. Hypotonic solutions get out of the vessel, right? Get out of the vessel and into the cell. And then hypertonic solutions enter the vessel, out of the cell, okay? So then talking about vascular access. So there's all kinds of different kinds of vascular access that we could go over. Um, and so when we talk about peripheral vascular access devices, so this is IV therapy, um, which requires placement of a vascular access device. Okay, we have to have a way to give IV fluids and things. So we're gonna choose the type of device based on the client's condition and the type of fluid and the anticipated length of treatment. Okay, there's a million types of devices. Okay, so um, when we're talking about peripheral vascular devices, we're talking about possibly just a peripheral IV, okay, where we can insert that ourselves as the nurse on the floor, where you've probably had in the bend of your arm. Um, and those are typically used for short term treatments. You're getting short term. Um, antibiotic or you're in the hospital for a short stay, typically they want those catheters, those IV catheters changed every three to seven days, depending on your policy and that kind of thing. So that's one that we can do on our own. Um, however, if you start to, um, if you start to get to a point where you have a patient who is having um, a long-term treatment, maybe with a, um, antibiotic or something, and they, they even can do this at home. They can get a, a long-standing IV or called a PIC line or a central venous access device. Um, and with that, with a central venous access device, they can actually go home with that and then come back maybe once or twice a week to get their chemotherapy or to get their um, IV antibiotic. And with that, um, it causes less sticks it doesn't have to be changed as oft often, so it's a more permanent option than a regular IV, okay? These have to be put in by specially trained nurses, and everybody can't, not everybody can put these in, and they're typically ultrasound guided, okay? So with this central venous access device, um, this is just basically an IV line that's inserted into a major vein, okay? Typically, they use the bend of the arm or a little bit above that in that subclavian vein or that internal jugular vein as well. So there's a bunch of different kinds of central venous access devices. We're not going to get into all of them, but just know that there are lots of different ones, including a PIC line. If you've ever heard of a PIC line, that is a that is a type of a centrally um, located venous access device. Okay, so with a PIC line, it's long, soft, flexible catheter, and it's it's inserted and then it goes um, advanced into the superior vena cava of the heart. Okay, again, it has to be a qualified nurse who is certified and uses ultrasound to get it into um, the arm, 
okay? Um, and then just a brief touch on subcutaneous infusions. So these are an alternate method to administer medications, um, continuous fluids or nutrition. So they have been widely used in home-based therapy with palliative care patients. Um, and an advantage of these are that um, they're low cost, they're easy to use, they're low infection and low complication rates. So with sub-Q infusions, it's almost like they just have like um, – continuous infusions into their belly or some other subcutaneous um, area, okay? So it's kind of an alternative to um, an IV, okay? So we're talking about venipuncture. So I'm not going to get into this here in large detail, but you can walk through it in your book because we will practice the skill in lab. But when we're talking about venipuncture, we always want to make sure that we're choosing a good vein, and that means one that we can feel really well. A lot of new nurses don't want to go after ones that they can't see. But a lot of times if you can feel it well, you're going to get it good. Okay. Sometimes the seeing can be a little bit um, deceptive. Okay. Um, also, with age, we want to consider that typically adults are easier because they hold still. They have bigger veins. They're better hydrated. Things like that. With infants, they have smaller veins. So you may need some help, someone to help you stabilize the site and help during the procedure. And then the elderly have very skin, very thin skin or fragile veins. So that can cause a problem. Then we also want to consider um, what kind of fluids are we or what kind of solution are we giving through this, um, through this uh, uh, IV, right? Because um, some medications and some infusions and fluids are irritating. They can be very irritating to the tissue, okay? So infusing peripheral TPN. I know we talked about TPN, right? Total parenteral nutrition. That's when the nutrition is all dissolved into a bag of fluid, and that's, like, all that they get. They don't get anything by mouth. That's all the, the food and nutrients that they need, right? So peripheral TPN can be irritating, okay? Um, everywhere that I've ever worked when inserting um, TPN, you have to give it through a PIC line or a central venous catheter. You can't give it through a peripheral IV. Um, and also there's irritating meds that can cause problems as well. We wanna consider the speed of infusion as well, right? So larger veins are required for faster rates of speed, okay? Or if the patient's getting IV contrast, or if you have a sick or a trauma patient, or if you have a patient that may need blood, their IV has to be a certain time, or a certain time, a certain gauge um, of IV. So these are all things to consider before starting your IV. Um, here we go. So complications of IV therapy. So when we're talking about complications of this, there are so many things that can go wrong, and you can review these in your book on page 39-8. There's a table, um, but we'll go over a couple of these different things. So there could be a hematoma, which is just a localized bruise, okay? So that can happen when they so-called blow the vein, right? Then there's infiltration. So an IV catheter, when, when infiltration happens, the IV catheter dislodges or it goes all the way through the vessel wall, and then the IV fluid that's infusing um, seeps out of the vein and into the surrounding tissues, okay? If that IV infusion is a vesicant, it can cause a lot of problems with infiltration, okay? So a vesicant, you're like, what is that? So that is a substance that can cause tissue blistering, okay? Typically, these patients' IV pumps are going to be are going to beep that they're included and the IV is no longer going to flush. However, um, that's a safety feature and we can't rely on that. So if infiltration is ever suspected, you need to stop the infusion immediately. Okay. No way around that. Stop it immediately. So infiltration. Okay. That's why we always check for infiltration when we're doing IVs. And that's where you can kind of see it sometimes if the fluid goes into the space it's not supposed to be, it will bubble up. And then extravasation. So this is the same as infiltration, except the IV fluid that's going in is a vesicant, okay? So that irritating fluid. So here we are with the vesicant again, right? How bad can this blistering be? So if you look at the picture A, picture A is at the time of an injury. So that when this, pa when this baby's um, IV infiltrated, that's at the time of the injury of picture A. Picture B is several days later, okay? So that extravasation required plastic surgery and multiple skin grafts in order for it to heal. So it can really be a big, big deal. 
Phlebitis, so this is inflammation of the vein that is caused by trauma to the vessel or irritation due to fluid administration, okay? Um, sometimes you'll see an example of this with the fluid um, that has potassium in it. So IV potassium infusions tend to be pretty uncomfortable for patients. They burn because they're very hard on the vein, okay? So the patient may feel pain or warmth at the site, um, that kind of thing. So that could cause phlebitis. Um, a big identifier of phlebitis is that you know a palpable cord that runs along that vein. Okay, so a raised red or hard line that runs along the vein from the insertion site upwards. Okay, um, again, signs and symptoms of phlebitis, pain, warmth at the site, local swelling, um, that kind of thing. Okay, same as infection. Um, and then thrombophlebitis. This is an inflammatory process that causes a blood clot to form and block one or more veins. Okay. Um, and then a local infection. So poor technique during insertion or leaving the catheter in place for too long can cause this. That's why it's so important that you know that inserting an IV is a sterile procedure. Okay. You must keep the tip of that catheter sterile, right? You can see in this picture on the right how you can see that the catheter is over the actual needle. And that is the true, that's an angiocath there. And, and we'll learn more about this in lab too. Um, nerve injury could happen. So damaging the nerve during a vein puncture. So this is most common when you're using the veins on the inner surface of the wrist and the forearm. Um, plus the patients hate it right there because it hurts really bad. Um, and then septicemia. So this is something in the tubing, fluid, or IV catheter that becomes infected and leads to infection in the bloodstream. In the bloodstream. So we're talking about going septic, right? Um, fluid overload. This is infusing the wrong type of fluid, and then if you infuse it too fast, or use too much, or use the wrong type of fluid, it can cause fluid overload, right? That excess fluid volume. Um, and then an air embolus. So this is a very rare complication where a gas or an air bubble is large enough to block a blood vessel. That's why when we prime our, our bag of fluid, we make sure that there's no air bubbles in that bag of fluid. We don't ever want to send an air bubble into our patient's body. And then a catheter embolus. So this is more common than an air embolus. Um, and it's typically caused by trauma or surgery. Um, and it's when um, the catheter tip breaks off and moves through the vascular system um, until it blocks a vessel, which is a problem. You can see that it broke off here in that picture. The very top of it's like kind of bent over. And that would happen inside the patient's body. Um, and then again on subcutaneous infusion. So what are these? These are used to administer medications, continuous fluids, or nutrition. Okay, they're effective in home base or palliative care patients, right? So palliative care, we're thinking maybe they're dying, right? Um, hospice or just keeping them comfortable. Typical sites you're going to see is those sub subcutaneous sites. So the back of the arms, the thighs, the back, the fatty part of the back, and then the abdomen. And like we talked about, low cost, very easy, minimal infections and complications with these. And just a little bit about blood administration. So this is important that you get the concept of blood administration because it will be um, covered on your exam. So um, there are four blood types, right? So type A, type B, type AB, and type O. RH factor is also important when blood typing. So you are either RH positive or RH negative. Right, so you could be A positive or A negative, B positive or B negative, A B positive, A B negative, or O positive, O negative. Okay, that's your RH factor, the positive or the negative. You inherit your blood type, and you can only receive compatible blood. You can not receive blood that is incompatible incompatible with your own blood group. Okay, it will cause a hemolytic reaction, and you will die from it. So that's why giving blood is so important. So when giving blood, so just consider this. So everybody's got their own blood group, right? So group O is your universal donor, okay? That group O can give blood to absolutely anyone, okay? As far as the blood type, right? Group O is the universal donor. Group AB is the universal recipient. So that means absolutely every other blood type can um, give to group AB, right? But AB is not the universal donor. 
Group O is the universal donor. You can give, group O can give their blood to anyone else. Group AB can get blood from anyone else. Okay, and look at this picture to make it easier for you. This is going to show you that group O can give their blood to O, A, B, and AB, right? And group A can only give blood to group A and group AB, right? And group B can only give their blood to group B and group AB. And then group AB can only give their blood to group AB, right? RH positive patients can receive po RH positive and RH negative blood products. But RH negative patients can only receive RH negative blood products, okay? If you give RH positive blood products to a patient who is RH negative, they will have a reaction, okay? You, you need to know that. So when we're talking about giving blood, so why do we give blood? Okay, so blood is able to replace both volume and oxygen carrying capacity in hypovolemia as well as clotting factors, right? So they've lost blood. That's why we give blood because they've got a low hemoglobin or low hematocrit. They've got some sort of anemia. They're having symptoms, right? Um, so when we're giving blood, it is critical to identify the patient and the blood product when transfusing blood. Before and be before beginning a transfusion, you have to verify that written prescription for the blood product. And then you need to obtain a set of vital signs five to 15 minutes before initiating the infusion, okay? If the patient's temperature is elevated, we're gonna inform the primary care provider before hanging the transfusion, okay? We wanna be able to identify if the elevation in temperature is from a reaction. So we wanna be careful giving blood to someone who already has a fever or a compromised immune system, okay? Most patients experience a minor elevation in temperature after the transfusion is giving, okay, given, okay? So a pre-existing elevated temperature may exacerbate that response. So as a result, um, they, may, they may order some Tylenol or something before so that we can get rid of that, right? Um, so we always want to make sure before we give that um, we have a patent I IV, right? It has to be an IV that is patent, that's running well. It has to be at least a 20 gauge. You can't give blood in anything smaller than um, a 20 gauge, okay? Um, and then we always want to remain with the patient for five minutes after that if infusion starts, okay? So to help prevent transfusion reactions, we have to be extremely careful in, ident in identifying the patient in the blood. We want to start the transfusion slowly, remain with the patients for the first five minutes of the transfusion, and assess again at 15 minutes. Okay, this is all dependent upon your hospital's protocol. So we always want to monitor for an allergic reaction, okay, or a transfusion reaction. They can. There's a variety of different kinds of transfusion reactions. It can be an allergic reaction, a bacterial reaction, febrile, hemolytic, circulatory overload, all of these are different kinds of reactions that can happen, okay? If a trans transfusion reaction occurs, your very first step is to stop the transfusion. Stop the transfusion, assess the patient, keep the vein open with normal saline, notify the provider, return the blood tubing in a biohazard bag to the blood bank, okay? We don't just throw the blood in the trash or just throw it in a biohazard box or whatever. We bag it up, all the tubing that was hooked up to your patient and everything, and you t send it up to the lab, to the blood bank, okay? So keep that all in mind. First thing you do, stop the transfusion. So this is what blood tubing looks like. So it looks different than regular tubing, okay? Um, this is also an example of the information that you would find on the blood bag. So each blood bag has the RH type, the ABO group of the patient, the expiration date, the identification number, okay? Blood is always administered through special blood tubing because this tubing has a special filter attached. It also has a Y, if you see that's like a Y tubing. It goes from, from that filter in the middle, it goes up into a Y, two sides, okay? With the Y, this allows you to hang normal saline at the same time. Normal saline is the only compatible fluid that you can administer with blood, okay? I want you to write that on your forehead so you look at it every time you look in the mirror. Normal saline is the only compatible fluid you can administer with blood. Anything else will cause 
a crystallized reaction and be a big problem. So when you're hanging blood, you see the, the blood is hung to the left side of this Y, and then your saline is, is hung to the right side of this Y. And then they both filter into this filter, and then there's the clamp, and then it goes to the client. Okay, so um, when we're thinking about this, the point of hanging the saline is to, first of all, we prime the line with the saline, and then we prime it with the blood, okay? That's the only thing that can be given with blood, right? So let's think about delegation with blood administration, okay? So the nurse is the only one that's able to start the blood, as well as the only one to get the initial 5-minute and 15-minute vital signs, Okay, during this time, the nurse should also be assessing the patient. Start your blood slowly. So if your patient has a reaction, you haven't slammed in half a unit of blood already. A transfusion reaction is most likely to occur in the first 15 minutes of the transfusion or the first 50 mils of blood. Okay. So here's your transfusion reactions. This is an easy mnemonic to be able to remember them. Okay, so you can see more information on this on table 39-10 on page um, 1492. So there's three big reactions. First of all being the allergic reaction. So your patient has an allergy to the blood being transfused. It looks like an allergic reaction with flushing, itching, hives, wheezing, and occasionally even anaphylaxis. Okay, that's your allergic reaction. Your febrile re reaction, so your patient has a sensitivity to white blood cells, to platelets, or to plasma proteins in the transfusion blood. They typically get fevers, chills, or an achy feeling. And then there's a hemolytic reaction. So this is a serious transfusion reaction, but it's typically rare. So this occurs when incompatible blood is transfused, right? That's why it's so important to double identify your patient. The patient's immune system attacks the blood cells that are being transfused and it destroys them. These patients typically feel terrible and this can be very fatal. So signs and symptoms for this are going to be fever, chills, shortness of breath, chest pain, tachycardia, hypotension. Okay? So what's the first treatment for all these reactions? Step one, stop the blood transfusion, even if your patient is breathing well. Okay? Because more... The more that infuses, the worse the symptoms, okay? It only takes one second to stop that transfusion before you do anything else. So again, here is, um, which I think this was actually already in another PowerPoint of mine. So um, you've probably already seen it, but this is your intake and output nursing calculation practice for registered nurse RN. You know how much I love her. So watch that if you need help with that. Um, always remember at least 30 mils an hour for output, right? Let's test your knowledge. So Joan, age 18, she donates her blood for a scheduled surgery. She is a Jehovah's Witness and believes that blood transfusions are not acceptable. She requires a transfusion after surgery. As the blood is transfusing, transfusing, she states, I know that this is wrong, but I do not want to die. Why do I need this blood? She starts to cry. How should you respond, if at all? What resources, if any, should you obtain for the client? And what should be your initial actions? So with this, Joan is experiencing a conflict between her choice and the practices of her religion. She understands um, that blood is not typically accepted by Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? So this patient's questioning her decision, right? Um, she's also providing us information about her feelings. So we want to explore the patient's understanding of her need for the transfusion. Her question is, why do, we need, why do I need this blood? So we can tell she has a lack of knowledge. So she needs some information um, and some informed consent about the blood. We need to tell her why she needs it, right? So an appropriate response to show compassion or caring is going to be to hold her hand or stay with her, asking her to discuss her feelings. I can tell you're concerned about this transfusion. Let's explore how you're feeling, right? In addition, we want to obtain information about her knowledge as to why she's receiving the transfusion in a manner that doesn't blame her. Okay, for example, let's discuss what you were told about transfusions prior to signing the consent form. That would be an easy way to ease into that. Her question may be rhetorical. However, because this patient can refuse any treatment at any time, this is going to provide insight into her knowledge base. Okay, 
Um, and then like her statement, I do not want to die, infers some knowledge of why the transfusions need.